Well, hello, my friend. It's so wonderful to see you. Uh, I'm very excited to introduce you to our membership and have you here today. Uh, friends of Target 100, this is Dan Ariely, uh, a dear friend, someone I've worked, had the honor of working with uh, in our Shape of Days. We'll talk a little bit about that. But just so folks know who you are, um, you are a professor of psychology and behavioral economics at Duke. Uh, you are a founding member of the Center of Advanced Hindsight. You are the author of many bestsellers, um, Predictably Irrational, The Upside of Irrationality, and others. You have unbelievable TED Talks, and I'm going to direct some folks there uh, a a after our conversation. But really why I wanted to have you on today is because you have a brand new book, which you can see I have all my sticky notes in here, uh, called Misbelief. Um, and we're going to have a, a great conversation uh, about your new book and uh, our time together. Uh, so thank you for making the time today. Of course, with pleasure. Um, I, I figured it would be good to introduce everyone. Um, we call you a behavior uh, economics, you know, economist. What does that mean, just for the folks who don't understand that? Yeah. So, so you know, economics uh, economics believe that people are perfectly rational, right? That, that people always make the right decision and, uh, and always work in their best interest. And in fact, if we talk about uh, weight gain. Um, people, um, economists will say people want to gain weight. There's no, there's no gap between what people want and what people, what people do. It's the same thing. And behavioral economics comes to challenge that notion mm -hmm. and say, just because people behave a certain way doesn't mean that that's really what they want. And there, there, there are behavior, not there, but our behaviors are driven by lots of forces. Some of them are conscious, some of them are unconscious, some of them we understand, some of them we don't understand. And, and we can't just assume uh, that people behave rationally. And what we do is we do experiments. We do experiments to try and figure out exactly where people fail. But our goal is not just to document where people fail, but to think about, can we understand the failure? And therefore, can we suggest ways for improvement? And that's kind of the, the, the important part of it is that the goal eventually is to make us all live a better life. So we want to understand our shortcomings in order to do to do better. I love that. I mean, that's really what we talk about at Target 100. Everything we do here is to help people understand that, uh, you know, an, a, a mistake is actually or, or what you perceive as a mistake uh, is actually a really great learning moment for you to understand your behavior and why you behave that way um, and and to um, to change it. So um, for for those of you guys watching, Dan and I worked on a, a, a product called Shapa, which is a numberless scale, which I still talk about all the time and recommend to folks. Um, and um, so you have a lot of background in helping people change their behavior in the health and wellness arena. What surprises you the most there in that arena versus others so um in 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 the arena of of, of weight changes yeah but may, maybe before before we go into that maybe i'll say something about my half a beard oh sure <laughs> people, people who don't know me uh it kind of looks like a strange choice um, so uh, this half a beard really has a few reasons uh, the first one is that I was badly burned uh, many years ago. So most of my body, including this side of my face, is is covered with scars. So it wasn't a, a choice, but there's just no hair on this. Doesn't side. If you look closer, you can see it's not exactly symmetrical, right? It looks it looks sort of symmetrical, but when you look closely, it's, uh, <laughs> it's not, uh, really symmetrical. But but the other the other reason for this, and this kind of gets us to social science and behavioral economics, is that for many years I shaved. And when I shave, I look less non-symmetrical. When you look, you can see that there's scars here and there's no scars here, but um, I shaved for many years. And a few years ago, I stopped shaving for a month. I went on a month long hike and I didn't shave. And when I came out, I looked sort of like this. <laughs> and I looked in the mirror, I didn't like this look. It's strange, it's very odd, very, very strange, it was strange to me. And I decided to, to get rid of this half a beard but I decided to wait a few weeks. This was like a, a, a memory. Like it took me a month to grow it. I said, I'll keep it for a few more weeks just as a memory. And two surprising things happened. The first one is that I got some notes from people who thanked me for the half a beard. 
And why did they thank me for the half a beer? These were people who were struggling with their own injuries. Mm -hmm. and they felt that they were trying to hide their own injuries. And here I was saying, look how much I don't care. I'm out <laughs> there with my, mm -hmm. with my injury. And it, told, and it told me, gave him a little bit of strength. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, if it gives people some strength, maybe I'll keep this half a beard for a bit longer. But then the other thing, um, the, the thing that was even more important and, and more unexpected was that four months down the line, I caught myself and I realized that I am feeling now differently about my own scars. Mm -hmm. Now, I got injured when I was you know, 17 and a half. It was many years ago. I've been walking around with scars for a long time. And, and I realized that the last few months, I've developed a better relationship with my scars. I did not feel that they were my enemy. They were not, they're just mm -hmm. a story of my life. And I thought, what has changed? Why now? Now, here's what I think happened. Think about somebody like me shaving. I wake up, smooth on this side, stubble on this side, and I shave. And for somebody like me, shaving is also an act of hiding my lack of symmetry. Mm -hmm. I was more non-symmetrical before the shave, little dots, less non-symmetrical after the shave, no dots. And in fact, if you think about it, it's an act of hiding. It's an act of hiding my lack of symmetry and giving up on that and saying, you know, this is just who I am with all of this lack of symmetry, with lots of other ones, by the way, was incredibly powerful and, and, and positive. And it got me thinking about all the kind of things that we do unintentionally that are actually damaging. Mm -hmm. Now, one, one general comment about social science, here I am, a social scientist, I should know these things, but there's nothing in my arsenal that would say four, down, four months down the line after not shaving, I would start feeling better about my scars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, if you ask me to predict day one with half a beard, I could tell you it's not going to be fun. Yeah. People would point, ask questions, kids would laugh, all kinds of things would happen. But if you ask me what would be this as an exercise of self-acceptance, there's nothing I can tell you uh, about it. Now, now after doing it, I can tell you, but I, for many years, I did something that was counterproductive. And I think that's really the, the point of social science is to discover those things that could help us, but our intuition is not pointing them to us mm -hmm. in, a regular, in a regular way. Mm -hmm. That's really helpful. Um, okay, but now you had a question of weight loss. So look, th there are few things in life that are very, very tough. And weight loss is one of the, uh, the biggest ones. Mm -hmm. and, and for two reasons. Uh, one is that we have to keep on fighting all the time. It's not something that you could say, oh, I'll do this. I'll run a marathon. I really have to work hard for a year or for six months or for four months, and then I'll be able to run a marathon. No, eating, eating well is a lifelong ambition. It's, it's not, it's not, there's no point in which you said I've achieved it. No, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not like a marathon is a long run, but this is much longer. And, and the second is that a lot of our psychology what really helps us is not doing something completely. Let's say alcohol. Mm -hmm. With alcohol, you could say, I'm done drinking. Not easy, not easy, but you can say, I'm eliminating alcohol. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it helps uh, stopping smoking. You can say, I'm not smoking. We can't say I'm not eating. There's no, there's no option for that. So the, the temptation is not just that it's a difficult choice, but it's a choice we need to make all the time. It's in another forkful, another spoon, another, another thing. So it's a, it's a very, very tough, mm. very tough struggle. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll tell you something that I'm starting to think about now, but I don't have a good answer yet. I'm, I'm trying to, to think about how can we find joy in difficult things? Mm -hmm. So. You know, the idea that we could come to people and say, look, this is going to be difficult and painful and miserable, but you have to do it every day for the rest of your life. That's just not a very, um, not a very welcoming strategy. Now, 
we can make it less painful, we can make it more habitual, easier, all of those things are good and, and, and we should do all of those. But we should also try to figure out how do we make those things rewarding? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, people need to feel joy. Yeah. You know, the, the, it's not, the, the, the fear is just not going to, to sustain us enough. We need to, we need to find joy. So, I started work and um, talking to experts, like I talked to some experts, pianists mm. and, and runners, mm -hmm. and, and I, I try to, and, and actors, mm -hmm. uh, theater actors who do the same thing over and over, and I try to understand from them, where is their source of joy? Where is the source of satisfaction? And, and the runner um, told me something really interesting. He said that he notices the relationship between the way his feet drop on the ground and his breath and he basically said that he created lots of nuances mm. he now pays attention to mm. and the same thing was also for the concert pianist who said that they are they, they pay tremendous attention to little nuances trying to prolong something by a fraction of a second make something a little shorter by fractions of a second um, and and I think there are things like that that we can think about in eating as well. Mm -hmm. You know, that, so there's of course there's the Buddhist trick of how long can you eat a grape or a blueberry or you know slow things down on, on eating. But I think it's not just a slowing down. I think there is a question of where do we find joy? Where can we find joy in a in in the world of healthier eating? Is it by understanding hunger and i don't think people should wait until they're starving but should we should we become more aware in the same way that the runner is becoming aware of their feet should we develop heightened awareness uh, for our body mm -hmm. i tried pilates once i don't know if you tried pilates yes. <laughs> okay I, I tried it once and the teacher and the teacher said these strange things. She said, breathe from your stomach. I, I have no idea where I'm breathing from. You know, the, all, all of these nuances. Now, now, you know, I think that she, she wasn't making it up. The people who do Pilates regularly get this skill. Mm -hmm. they, know, they know what it is to breathe from your stomach. They, they have a very different sense of their bodies where their bodies are, how they're situated. And, and the question is, can we, can we learn to enjoy other aspects? Now, all of this is just, you know, thoughts. I don't have a good yeah. idea, but I, think, but I think it's an important direction to explore, to say in the world of healthy eating, um, what are the potential sources of things that we could feel mastery? an improvement an achievement and and so on and if we can do it then it's then let's let's look for those things mm. i love this i mean that is really our heart and soul it's funny that we're talking about that is our tagline is making healthy joyful mm -hmm. and because we do believe I, I lost 65 pounds 15 years ago and i've been working to keep that off i've worked behind the scenes at weight watchers and lifetime fitness and all the big big names and what I think has come out of that in, is that the, the, the idea of weight loss has become one of negativity and deprivation and what I can't have, or I was look, looking through your book and, and reading a lot and I want to kind of get over there is like that scarcity mentality, right? That idea of what yeah. I can't have and what, what, what is taken from me for a period of time. And we talk about this in a, a way so differently at Target 100 about what can we do to make this fun and joyful and thinking of it as the game of golf, right? A person who plays golf never feels like they've mastered the game. Yeah. Don't say I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm a perfect golfer now. And they play for life. So getting in that mindset of this is something of a practice that I continue to evolve through. Because I can tell you that now I'm 52 years old. My healthy eating program, my exercise program looks completely different than it did even three years ago. And so when we think of it like a Rubik's cube that is constantly getting scrambled and then we're working 
to put those sides into alignment for us where we are now yeah. in different pillars it becomes very it becomes a totally different experience that people can stay with long term mm -hmm. because it isn't that negative depriving yeah. on off in out situation that i think yeah. the industry has really conditioned people uh into in a way where I often have trouble when people come into our program convincing them that this can be wonderful and joyful and 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 that that's kind of brings me to your to your book. I mean I I feel like people have almost been inundated so deeply in this in these belief systems around what weight loss is, they can't even come to a space to know that it can be something different. Yeah. Um so, so first, of all, I, I, I certainly agree with you. And you know, this punishing approach uh, can work for a short time, but it's not a long-term strategy. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, how, how long can we expect people to, to basically say, it's miserable, but I'll just keep on doing this. And, and, and it's not just that, because when deviations occur, and they will occur because that's our nature, uh, the question is, do people feel bad about themselves? And, and we see this in a very similar way with type 2 diabetes, mm -hmm. where doctors tell patients, if you will not be careful, you will need mealtime insulin. And if you're not, and then when people get to that stage, and it might not have to do anything with what they did, it's just, you know, their biology, um, all of a sudden there's shame connected to it because society is telling them, oh, you did something badly. The reason you're here, you didn't have to be here, it's your fault. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and that's just a deeply demotivating situation. Yeah. And that, well, exists, that exists weight yeah. for sure, right? Yeah. Constant shame from yeah. society about the choices that you make or didn't make um, on yeah. people, for you sure. Know, the, the, so, so the book, the book is really a book about people who adopt very counterproductive beliefs. Uh, I give a lot of examples from COVID, uh, but but it's really not about COVID. It's about what happens to people who are stressed and their need. You know, the 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 few insights I had in this book was one was that adopting strange beliefs about what's happening in the world cabal, whatever, G5, is actually a response to a real need. That mm -hmm. We shouldn't discount it. We should, we should understand that this is a real response to a real need that people have. It's not the best response. It's not the response we would choose for them. It's not a healthy response, but it's a, it's a response. And we need to understand it as, as that. Um, so that's, that's one thing, right? I don't understand the world. I'm confused, things are difficult. I was promised it will work this, uh, this way and, and not. And, and the, the other, uh, and then of course, there's the funnel of misbelief, the way we stress, consume information, personality and social, but- And I have, to, I have to just stop you and say like that, the intro is unbelievable what you went through in, yeah. in this. And that, that you, someone who is revered and has spent his life literally trying to help people behave in a more positive way that gives them a better outcome in their life became the target of yeah. these real online conspiracy theories. It was an unbelievable, I sat there shaking for you reading this. It was, it, it's hard to imagine. By the way, I got the, the last the last death threat I got was about three weeks ago. So it's, it's but for the first two years, it was daily. Yeah, was yeah. Daily. yeah. Um, but, but you know, the, the, the two components, which I think uh, resonate uh, a lot with uh, this issue of the question of, of weight loss, one is, is stress. That's what um, I want to talk about. That's, that's one in a big way. And the other one is a loss of trust. Yes. And, and no, I wish you could see my notes. So those are the two things I have in bold stress yeah. and loss of trust. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, when I, when I try to define misbelief, uh, for me, misbelief has kind of three components. The first one is a belief in something that is not true or that most people don't believe or the experts don't believe or something like that. That's about the outside world. 
but it's also about the person. And about the person, it's about the fact that this misbelief is a basic tenant of their life, and it's a lens through which they view other things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and that's important, right? So it's not something that I think, oh, you know, um, maybe fat is not as healthy as people say, or maybe sugar is not as unhealthy or something. It's not, it's not like maybe, it's no. no. This is a core belief, and I view the world uh, this way. And, and from that perspective, I think people who are serious dieters, um, you know, have, have some similarities. One is it's, you know, they probably have some stress in, in their lives, partially for all kinds of reasons, but including, including that. Um, but they also uh, adopt this perspective as a central tenant in their life, and they view everything from that, uh, from that lens. And then the, the question of trust is, is very important because, you know, the number of people who get promised a diet, believe it, start it, something is working from them, lose faith, fail, lose faith, you yes. know, one of them leads yes. to the other one, um, and then, and then get, get to, um, look at life in a very different way yes and, and and you know just just think about the devastating experience of somebody who's doing everything a diet should should tell them to do and they're not losing the way that they were promised yeah or maybe they lose for the first 10 weeks and then it slows down or stop or a little bit even reversed you know what are what are people supposed to to think how are people supposed to to interpret that or how do they how do they recruit the amazing motivation that they need to mm -hmm. keep on trying when yeah. things are not working yeah. this way. But it reminds me so much. I mean, so many of the pieces of your book, you know, things of, of uh, the difficulty to make change, right? Even your, your story about your beard, right? Making that change and not knowing, not having a, a crystal ball to know what, what four months down the road would look like is very similar here, right? You, you embark on a journey and you've been falsely uh, you falsely believe that this journey is a 10 weeks to, to rock hard abs or whatever it is. Right. Yeah. And then, and, and I, I mean, I lost and gained hundreds of pounds on multiple diets in my life. I started in diet centers at 14. So I was in that lens, right. Of like this thing, uh, it has kind of been this way that I viewed the world and was became my, my passion to unravel it for people and create a space um, but the, the the difficulty to make change and to to be in a space of um, I was reading your um, your thoughts about ambiguity, right? To be yeah. in that space and have not know, right? Yeah. The outcome is yeah. a very difficult place for people to live, and yeah. a lot of this process you know, it, you have to be able to sit in that because it's not like by saying no to one cookie, you get this big. That's right. That's right. If, if the world was um, like we as humans uh, function very well in a world in which we have an activity that is punished or rewarded in a very clear way immediately. Yes. So basketball. <laughs> It either goes in or not, you get the feedback, you get rewarded, you get punished. I mean, that's, yeah, that's a good, that's a good setup. And, um, and in a, in a, in a world in which the weight gain comes eight days to two weeks later, <laughs> and sometimes hidden by uh, weight gains of, uh, you know, whatever, uh, liquid uh, retention or um not going to the bathroom or whatever uh, it's very very tough because we don't get this this reward circuitry uh, going on going on at all and and the the progress is so slow and so delayed mm -hmm. that that we can't focus on the outcome you know we 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 think that you can either focus on the outcome or the process and, and every, everybody knows that we need to focus on the process. Like imagine, imagine two kids 
uh, kid one doesn't study for the exam. Studies like 10% of the material. And luckily, the exam was mostly about that 10%. So they ace the exam. The other kid really, really studies hard. They cover 90% of the material. But unlucky for them, most of the exam was about the 10%. Yeah. They didn't study and they basically get a barely passing grade. Who sh whose parents should congratulate them and reward them? And, and you know, of course, the, the first kid succeeded more. Mm -hmm. But it's not the behavior you want to encourage. If you encourage the first kid, they will say, oh, I did something right. What did I do? I didn't study much. Let me keep on doing that. And if you punish the second kid, you basically take a kid who did all the right things that would work in principle yeah. in the long term. And, and we are just not good at that. Mm -hmm. We are not good in rewarding process instead of outcome, but we really have to. We can get better at it though, right? Yeah, but, in, but in, we, need, we need to design things differently. Yeah. We need to design things differently. So, you know, in, in, in Shaper, for example, as, as you well know, we say standing on a scale in the morning is its own good thing. Yeah. Doesn't matter how much you weigh, Number, because yeah. we know that the act of standing on the scale is by itself a reminder to eat a little bit less for breakfast. But in the same way, you want people who follow the plan to feel good about themselves, regardless of the weight fluctuations. Yes. Because that strategy is a good strategy long term. Yes. By the way, imagine, imagine that a, a particular diet um, helps lose weight 60% of the days, and it and doesn't work for 40 percent of the days it's actually quite wonderful <laughs> right but but if you look at every day you would be confused yeah. even even if it's helpful 55 percent of 55 percent of the day and, and doesn't work 45 like if a stockbroker was successful 55 percent of the day and, and failed 45 percent of the day they would make, be incredible but it's because over the long term, it's a good strategy. But if we look at each particular day, it's just heartbreaking. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but that's not how we think naturally. Yeah. Our, our, yes, our, that's it. Or the short term, that, that, that very big. The program. short term and the desire for feedback. The desire. desire for immediate feedback. So, you know, even, even I, like if I stand on a scale, and I said, yesterday was a really good day. I went for a run and I had a salad and my weight goes up. I know it's not supposed to show up today, but it's still a little bit. Right. I, it's still annoying. It's still right. annoyed a little bit. Still, I feel like, you know, something is wrong with physics. Like, what, what happens? Right. Physics stopped working. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. no, I, I think that um, this is also helpful, right? And, and you're, you know, we're really just so much talking about what we do here. Um, we have six pillars and one of the pillars, you know, we have food, of course, and exercise movement patterns, uh, hydration, and then there's sleep and then stress. And yeah. there are six pillars and people always say to us, we love it because there's six ways to win. There's six places in which we're getting feedback instead of just one or maybe two. And, that and they all, and they all interact. And they all interact, right? They all what interact that because, like sleep creates. Yeah, because that's right. Sleep, stress, eating, mm -hmm. all, all connected. By the way, there's a, there's a study that we did that you, I don't know if, if you remember, or I don't know if it was after you, after we um, stopped working together. We, we basically, tr we analyzed um, thousands of type 2 diabetes patients. And we try to understand what separates the people who are managing to control their A1C and the ones who are not. You know, some people are better at it, some people are worse. What, what is it about those people? And you can have all kinds of hypotheses. Maybe the people who understand the disease better are better at this. No. 
Maybe the people understand how to measure blood sugar level. No. Maybe the people understand side effects. No. And no, 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 no. The only thing that we found was, effect, was relevant was how many days in a regular week, a regular month, they reported to have breakpoints. And what are breakpoints? We all have our stress accumulated mm. throughout the day, right? We, we start and then we have uh, our boss and our spouses and our kids, and uh, we try to over, uh, like, say no to a cookie and a Facebook and, you know, huh? and at some point it gets too much. And by the way, we all have it. If you're with diabetes, it's extra hard because you have to also exercise and manage your blood sugar level and so on. But if you're on a diet or counting calories, it's, it's extra. You have extra management layer. And sometimes at some point we fail. And we say some curse words and say, <laughs> I don't care about the future. I don't I care about the future. Want, I just want some fun right now. Indeed. And what's the cheapest, most available, mm -hmm. easiest way is food, right? And what we found is if you look at the regular behavior, that doesn't separate the people who manage their A1C well and not. The thing that matters is how many times a month they have these days with breakpoints. Mm -hmm. And it basically says, and I don't know about your program and the people in your program, but if I, if I made a similar relationship, I would say it's not about the regular day. The regular day is probably quite good. It's about these outliers. Yeah. And, and eating is one of those things that we could be good six days a week and one day a week mess the whole thing up mm -hmm. with a few donuts. Yeah. So, so the, the question really, if that's, if that's the case, and you know, usually we think about the average. Here's my standard behavior. But it might be that it's not the standard behavior. The standard behavior, yes, we can make improvement, we could fix and so on. But it could be that the real struggle is to eliminate the outliers. Reduce these breakpoint days from twice a week to once a month, right? Yes. I'm not, I'm not saying eliminate, but well, basically. And, and then, you know, what we teach too, and it's so wonderful that we're talking about this, right? That thing that happens, we call it decision fatigue at the end of it, right? A stress comes so high that we have, we have lost our capacity to make a decision. That stress point, um, and and that's okay to have a break point to even and to to make a choice that maybe isn't the greatest choice for you. But if for us it's all about can we can we not fill it with guilt and shame? Because mm -hmm. guilt and shame highlight the reward center in the brain, right? Yeah. And we get this ongoing behavior. If we can isolate it to one moment, right? If we can turn it from like you said, two days to one day to a half a meal, you know, a half a meal, yeah. or grabbing one donut instead of three days off the wagon. So, so there's, so there are two, there are two points. One is to say, can we, can we predict those breakpoints? Mm -hmm. Can we do something about them? For example, I, I don't know if that's standard, but for me, I find that if I exercise, I lose my appetite. So, so if I feel that this is like a breakpoint kind of a day, uh, going for a run in the evening is actually very helpful. And, well, but, but the second thing that you're pointing out is that if it's not, so it's about reducing those numbers, but it's also reducing the shame and guilt mm. about, about those uh, when it happens. Mm. Um, and, you know, there's, um, you know, the Calvinist religion? Yeah, sure. So, so in Calvinism, uh, people are born, um, and it's already known when they are born if they're going to heaven or hell. It's predestined. There are good people or bad people. People are born good or bad, and the good people would go to heaven, and the bad people go to hell. There's nothing you could do throughout your life. <laughs> change. But, but the notion is that people try to convince themselves that they are the good type. Um, but but if, if you're the good type, you always are good. If you're the bad type, it doesn't mean you're always bad because you could try to convince yourself that you're good. 
Now, what happens in, in Calvinism, this is where the expression, what the hell effect comes from. Yeah. Because if you, if you are a bad person, destined to hell, and you try to cheat yourself, you try to convince yourself that you're good, so you act well, 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 one time you act badly. That one time is basically saying, no, 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 you're going to happen. Because good people never act badly. You acted even one time badly, you revealed yourself. You're the bad person. And now um, you say to yourself, if I'm going to hell, I might as well enjoy it. And, and you can see where, where this, I'll start my diet next Monday or next month or, and so on. It's about, it's about the fact that the behavior people feel is revealing something about themselves. And we froze a little. I don't know if it will work out or not. But yeah, we froze a minute. <laughs> we'll, we'll find out. We'll find out if the recording, if the recording worked or not. But I'll, I'll repeat this just in case. Yeah. So in Calvinism, if you act badly, if you act well, if you act good, it could be either because you're the good type or because you're the bad type, but you're trying to hide it. Trying to hide it, yeah. If you're acting badly. Now we know who you are. And, and now you say to yourself, if I'm going to, have, to hell, I might as well enjoy, enjoy life while, while I'm here and let me do other things. And, and the psychology of that is very, very powerful. And Calvinism puts a lot, a lot of pressure on never behaving badly. But the cost of that is that one bad behavior uh, can get people to be completely derailed. And, and, and those notions about guilt and shame and, and feeling bad, yes, you know, they make it less likely to happen in the beginning. Yes. Once it happens, the consequences are, are, much, are much worse. So we, we really have to, to figure this out. And, you know, because, because eating well is a lifelong struggle for all of us. It, it's a lifelong struggle for all of us. Cookies are just really good. They're, I mean, they're so good. Right? Right? Somebody is designing them. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm thinking about them as weaponized food, right? Somebody. Oh, is, that, and it's true. They are yeah. designing them. They are designing, <laughs> they're designing with a goal that we would crave one. And once we eat one, we want another one and another one. I mean, they're designed like this. That's the complexity, right? The complexity of the of the weight loss equation is not, you know, again, another really important piece of what you talk about is environment. I mean, the environment that we live in now is it's built for us to to be sedentary, to not, you know, eat well. The food is chemically enhanced so that we can't stop eating it, right? Yeah. And, and so it's very funny, right? That 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 this becomes something that again, you know, you start to have this belief system that I can't do this because yeah. I failed so many times, or because it is too hard, or you know, because uh, what the heck? If I'm going to be overweight, I may as well just be overweight. Then I hear that all the time of like, so what the heck, right? What the hell? Uh, as yeah. you say that yeah. people giving in and giving up. Yeah. And you know, the other thing, the other thing is that um, it's hard to intuit, like, in, as I said, with my beard, it's hard to intuit four months down the road. And we get used to wait slowly over time. Yes. And it's hard to intuit how it would feel like three years down the line. And I'll give you a, a strange example. Uh, but when I was in hospital originally, I just when I got burned, I had the tube that fed me. So a tube through my nose and it fed me and they fed me 30 eggs a day and 7,000 calories a day. And this was, I needed so much to build, to build tissue, right? I, tissue takes a lot of energy to, to build. And I lost weight with that, uh, with that diet. But anyway, I, I'm on that tube almost four months and one day they come and they say the day after tomorrow we're taking the tube out you'll start eating by yourself and my first impression was my first reaction was that's a terrible idea <laughs> uh, and i and i said who wants to eat 
I said, why? Why would I want to spend so much of my day chewing and eating and cutting things? And it's so convenient. Like you have this tube, there's a machine, it pumps. And I said to myself, I've discovered the future. One day people would stop with this nonsense. People don't see how stupid it is to spend so much time eating. I always thought it was a flaw. I thought it was a flaw that we have to eat and feed okay. ourselves so many people, times a day. Okay, what, what a waste of time. I said, one day nobody would walk around with a tube, but one day people would take pills and, and that would be it. And we'll stop this nonsense of spending so much time and energy in the human endeavor on, on, on making food and eating. But of course, I was the patient, there were the doctors, they took it out, I started eating, and of course, I remember that food tastes amazing. <laughs> Since then, I had a hard time stopping. But, but the, point, the point of the story is that in four months, I forgot how good food, how food tastes like, how, how good it tastes. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you ask me, do you remember that food tastes, I would say yes, but I didn't really remember the taste. And, and you know, all of us, by the way, taste is a very fleeting experience, right? It's very hard to say, okay, how does a strawberry feels like? I can, I can imagine a little bit, but it pales in comparison to, to compared to the strawberry. Now, once I eat one, then it reminds me of it, and I want another one, another one, and so on. But the, the, point, the, the, the point of this is that it is very hard for us to, to understand, to predict how we would be different in four months, six months, and so on. If, if, I, if I asked you, if you stopped eating for four months, would you say, you know what, I'm fine never eating again. I'm happy with the tube. Yeah, yeah. You don't think, you don't yeah it's hard to predict. That's right. Um, and you know, it's hard to predict how much more energetic we would feel if we lost 15 pounds and how differently we would sleep at night and uh, how bending would change and what physical activity uh, we would we would do and and all of those things are very hard for us to to predict these are these are like little small changes nuances. Right? these are the nuances that you're talking right. about yeah that's right um you know knees change a little bit with with weight gain and weight yeah. loss and, yeah. and bending changes a little bit and, and sleep patterns change and and the nature of craving changes we're just you know we we can predict tomorrow yeah but we're very bad in predicting six months down the line like stopping eating salt so why <laughs> how, how could i how could i but you know but yeah, well, and those those changes where you can't even feel the difference, right? The, yeah. With the change of salt, you can only go to a doctor and have him tell you that 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 low sodium diet really did wonderful wonderful yeah. things to your numbers, right? So those yeah. you can't even. It's not like pulling on jeans and they're fitting better all of a sudden, yeah. right? So yeah. there is no true reward in in that space. Yeah. Um, the belt, by the way, um, you know, in the in the Middle East. I was in, uh, in, in a few Arab countries last year, and they have a terrible obesity epidemic. Um, and of course, it's very hot, and food is very available, and recently fast food is, is more available. But they're saying that one of the reasons is that there are no belts for the men. That the Arab, the Arab dress, the uh, jalabiya, yeah. is, is, is without. Yeah. And, I think that you know moving moving a hole in, in, in the belt is is a it's a big moment. Is a time is a time to reconsider, yeah. That's your attention, right? That that too. Um, yeah. you know, I do think it's it's such an important thing though, as we you know, as we wrap up here. This this book is incredible, and I I'm gonna encourage all of my folks to read it because you talk so much about stress being this, and, and we talk about stress here. Maybe, about maybe, I'll say, maybe I'll say a word about this, this book. Um, yes, please. Because there's so many topics. So, you know, we all have people in our lives that uh, five years ago, we said we're the same. We perceive the world in the same way. We understand, we have a common language, we're the same. And we all have some of those people today that we say 
we are so different. How did I ever think we're all the same? And what this book does is really describe the psychology of their change. And it comes with empathy and understanding and no blame and just saying, let's understand their side of what the psychology is. And by the way, in the same way that the cookie is a weaponized device, there's a lot of information that is weaponized to get us down this exactly. funnel of misbelief. So the first thing it's about, it's about them. Um, it's about understanding their journey and also thinking about a little bit of what we could do to help. The, the second thing though, it's also about us because we all have beliefs that are not as supported as we think they are. Mm -hmm. There's a phrase that we use, what would it take to change your mind? Think about some of your strongly held beliefs and ask yourself, what would it take to change my mind? You would realize that there are many things you would say, oh, you know, it's not it's about that. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, and then as we talked, the, the book is also about this bigger question, which is trust. Uh, what happens to us as individuals, as society, as we, as we lose trust? So it's about them, <laughs> us, and about, and about trust. But it's, uh, you know, as we gain, go into a new political season, as we see what's happening in social media with the amount of fake news, as, as the world of information is becoming so much more complex, it's, it's important to, to stop, pause, and, and understand how it is that we form our opinions and our ideas. Yeah, I found it so powerful just from my lens, right, of always trying to help people with their health journey about because the massive amount of information, we call it diet confusion, and there's so yeah. much coming at people, these extreme plans and these these hyped things, and 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 the trust level is just gone, right? For for so many things at this point. And I think it's created all this apathy around the process of taking care of yourself. And yeah. and so no one believes anything, no one trusts anything. They they now just kind of feel that what the hell way. And they're they're and what's what's saddest for me is that the simplest things right, are the ones that actually work. So all of this noise and junk and, and, and information coming at people has created so much confusion that when I say something as simple as, right, uh, getting out for a walk in the morning for 20 minutes is, is almost life-changing for people. And then when they trust me enough to take the action and create the habit and trigger it, create a routine and, and find that reward system, they're like, how is it, right? It's almost like they've been lost in this stratosphere. That's why this was so powerful for for me, you know, not just in in all of the ways in which you wrote it and why you wrote it, but because it's what I'm seeing in my career as well, is that we're losing people to yeah. these really extreme versions and visions and inabilities to come back to just the truth about like what works. And, yep. and so I really thank you for it. And I want people to to spend some time, uh, you know, because of the, the stress piece, the ambiguity piece, the environmental piece, like all of the things that you're talking in there about, we talk about every day in Target 100. And so I thank you for this beautiful piece of work. Uh, and uh, I appreciate your time taking this time out of your day to have a conversation with me about it. Uh, with with pleasure and looking forward to the next time good well thank you stay safe great to thank see you, you. take right. care lovely to see you again bye